So thanks very much for, for having me. And I'm, I've got lots and lots of slides, so I'm going to run over them really quickly, but they'll be available um, afterwards um, if it, uh, and online, of course, if people want to want to look at them. I work for the International Longevity Centre and we look at the impact of longevity or of ageing on society. So we're interested in there are more older people. What does that mean? And while our focus is mainly on public policy, um, clearly, you know, there's a lot of implications for all of us about how we should be living our lives as we all get older. Um, some of you will have known and met Baroness Sally Greengross, who was until fairly until last summer our chief executive. Um, so she set up ILC more than 25 years ago as part of an international network. So we work um, with big companies, small companies, but we also work with government and um, in the UK and across the world to engage around what longer lives really means for all of us. Um, uh, the sort of top line of the sort of message you want to give is basically, and you'll know this, so there's an element of me telling you things you already know, so I'm sorry about that. Um, the world is getting older. Um, this is going to have a major uh, impact, but there are opportunities both in terms of the economy and aging is often portrayed as being an economic cost or a social cost. You'll have seen the debates in the last week around um, things like state pension age review and things like that. And there's always this perception that, you know, more older people is a cost. And I think we want to change that narrative. And I think um, people in the audience here have got a role to do in, in helping that as well. But maybe we'll come on to that in terms of the questions. I think one of the things I sort of wanted to start with is this, I think, a lovely quote from Barack Obama that I think is positive and optimistic in a world where actually it doesn't feel very positive and optimistic. You know? So back in 2016, in his first book, he said, you know, if you had to choose to choose a moment in history to be born, you choose now. And I, uh, I remember talking to an Oxford academic about this and she was saying that, you know, there is there is so much out there about how, you know, the world is terrible, terrible for younger people. Younger people can't afford houses. Um, um, you know the issues around poverty starting to it to increase issues around income but that is a really interesting sort of counter argument that actually we have access to the world's information younger people and in fact all of us have access to um pretty much you know i remember when i was younger i used to have to pop into a library and go through encyclopedia britannica to find things out now i can just go onto the internet and find it in about five seconds the were you know that we actually have the you know access to huge amounts of information um, that, that we just didn't used to have. And I think we should see that as being, being a, op, an opportunity. We know a lot more than we ever did, and it's a lot more up to date. Of course, this adds to stress and anxiety, but we are better informed about the world as a whole. Um, clearly, you know, for, you know, the, the starting point is we're, we're all living a little bit longer. Um, although it's not, you know, we have to be conscious that, you know, that this talk of everyone living very, very long lives has only been 100 people who've lived for more than a million hours. And if you put in context of the Queen, there were only about 100,000 people in the UK who were older than the Queen when she died. So, so, so we are living older, but actually um you know we're we're not living you know to 150 or whatever we could come back onto that into in the debate if we if we wanted to um and and one of the things you know that's sort of worth us reflecting is is my is that one of the challenges i think we all have as individuals and government has is that actually the aging society is, has happened very slowly and we we started aging in the UK and France and North America about 300 years ago so actually there's never been any sense of urgency to to change the way that we do things if you look however to places like Singapore and Hong Kong and South Korea they're going their population will age at the same pace but actually over 20 over 30 or 40 years so you will actually see perhaps some really interesting things going on in places like Hong Kong and Singapore and Korea because they're going to be forced into better supporting older people because because frankly the population is going to change so so quickly and and I think this you know so so one of the things I think we can all do is start looking to you know what's going on in some of those countries in terms of in terms of how we're adapting to a to aging I was actually on the phone this morning with um 
some people from um, from China actually who in China have a five-year plan on healthy aging and you know it puts many places to share you know it's got very very strong messages around actually how how they will invest in healthy aging and I think it's really we, it is important we look to what's going on in the rest of the world um, and then of course we you know the other sort of striking thing is of course whilst um, as you go forward, the the places that are currently oldest may not be in the future. So, and when I say oldest, I mean oldest in terms of average age of the population. So, within the European Union, of course, um, Northern and uh, in UK, France, Spain have have been the oldest of the the countries, it, Italy particularly. But actually, because of outward migration from places like Poland and Central and Eastern Europe actually in the next sort of 30 or 40 years we may find that places like Poland, um, parts of Central and Eastern Europe can actually get older on average than places like the UK. Um, we, we also know that population sizes are going to be falling because um, whilst whilst we are living longer lives um, and whilst the as many of you will know the population reached 8 billion people we know that population growth is is slowing um, what this really means and I think the context here for all of us in terms of thinking about how how we live our lives is actually just a lot more of us are going to be older so, so you know uh, and that's across the whole world we're having fewer children in most places um, and we're, we're living longer so so how do we make the most of that extra time and I think it's worth reflecting you know it is a remarkable change over the the past you know century or so we've had in the UK in terms of you know previous it's not that many generations ago that you know people were living sort of 20 30 years uh, uh, less than they are now in the UK so so how do we make the most of, of that opportunity um, looking forward, it, you know, um, there is, of course, significant uncertainty. And this is a chart we did a few years ago where you can see that, you know, um, we, you know, the it's not clear at all where life expectancy might go, how much longer longer we will live in the UK and across the world. Although it is worth saying we've historically always underestimated it. So actuaries always underestimated how long, how much extra we're going to live. Um, and 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 whilst we don't know um, what the future will hold, you know, we might have, you know, pills, you know, poly pills that include bits of statin and aspirin and things like that that all of us are are taking, but they're relatively cheap. Or we might have things like antibiotic resistance or climate change, which might have a which might knock back life expectancy. So there are certain things we don't we don't know, and we also don't know about migration. And clearly, one of the the impacts of COVID has been that you've seen over a few years very significant changes in in the number and the amount of migration. And this is relevant because historically, lots of countries have used, you know, migration as a way of changing the population population makeup in terms of the in terms of the balance. Um, there we yeah so, so a very long way of saying we don't really know what's going to happen in in the, in the future, but but actually. Um, it, it is worth saying back in 2019, just before COVID, I, we ILC did publish a report talking about the inevitability of another pandemic. So there's a, a sense of we can't predict the future, but there are certain things that we know are pretty much uh, pretty likely and we knew a pandemic was coming and yet we weren't prepared for it. Um, we know that equally inequalities are are unlikely to go away very significantly. So, you know, with that sort of background, you know, we're living longer. We're across the whole world. Where there are like population is that will eventually by sort of twenty fifty or so start to fall. Um, uh, in, in and and is already falling in places like Japan. Um, Korea and other other countries. Um, what what does this mean? What does it mean for us about how how we live our lives? What what should we be doing and and how and what should we be thinking about? So, first thing I just wanted to talk about in terms of sort of and this is the, a set of slides which I find really really interesting about, as I think is really useful in terms of thinking about how we spend our time and. There are a number of what academics call time use surveys, and what they do is they measure um, how wh how we spend our time on um, over the course of our lives. And um, 
this one is from the US. So, so what you will see here is, um, you know, as we so the, the the first chart on the left, what you see is, you know, when we get to our sort of 30s to 40s is the point at which we spend most of our time with children, which is it is not unexpected. It's when the age people have children, tend to have children. Um, so, 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 you know, it absolutely makes sense. The, the one on the right for me is really, really striking and actually should be one which we're thinking and worrying about. The time we spend alone pretty much, and these are from the US, but I don't think the figures are, are that much different for, for other countries. The time we spend alone increases pretty much from the from our 30s to our 80s. We spend more time alone. Um, what can we do about that? How can we help people? Um, in terms of that, of course, you know, some people like to spending spending time alone. It's not necessarily wrong, but actually, what you know, there is a really it's an interesting finding around sort of um, how we live our lives. We also, um, if you look at friends. Um, you know, we spend a lot of time with our friends until our actually, you know, our early 20s, at which point it really starts falling. And from our 30s to our 80s, we it, it's fallen quite significantly, which is really, really striking. Um, I think one of the things that's really interesting here for us interested in the life course is actually how can we um, stop this fall happening in our 20s and 30s or actually how do we increase it again from our 30s how do we get people in their 30s starting to re-engage with friends and friendship groups and it's quite you know it's quite hard for all of us in adulthood to make new friends so actually all the things that we can learn that we can do do around that um and similarly you see time spent with family falling um uh, you know as we get older and by the time we get into our 30s it's pretty pretty flat um the time spent with our partner um, you know, it, um, clearly um, is pretty flat from our 30s to our 60s, then it increases a bit. Um, I as, as, you know, typically one or both partners retire. Um, so, so, you, so we do spend a bit more time with our partner when we get into retirement. And then the time, however, we spend with co-workers um, clearly declines partly, of course, because people um, move out of the workforce, but I'll come back onto that because it's a really interesting sort of, um, thing to reflect on in terms of that at the moment. Um, this is um, similar data from the UK. You know, what, what do we do um, as we get older? Um, so this is from a study called the English Longitudinal Study on Aging. And what you will see is we do spend on average more time home alone. Um, we spend quite a lot of time watching TV and we spend less time with friend, family and friends in, in old age. So it's really clear that um, that actually that, that that as we get older, we tend to do um, um, you know, the, the way we spend our time does does change. We spend less time um, walking and exercising, less time commuting, um, a tiny bit more doing health related activities um, and, and volunteering increases a little bit. Um, so we but we do generally spend less time doing some of these activities we might have done during our working life. Um, there is this perception that everyone, everyone over 65 spends their entire time on holidays and you see this in the media sometimes. But actually what's really clear is if you ask people on in the last 12 months, have you taken a holiday and trip or trip um, it, it both in terms of in the UK and abroad and a day trip, it falls with age. So people tend to do this a little bit, uh, a bit less. Uh, um, we have less sex as we get older, um, which is an interesting one. Um, um, we've done some work on, but actually we do, you know, we, and actually we, there is um, uh, one of the things that, again, that sort of um, often sort of, again, particularly in the media ignored is that actually um, um, clearly people have physical relationships um, into, you know, well into their 80s and, and beyond. And I think sometimes people are very, very surprised about that. And I think there's a really interesting narrative there. Um, and, and actually, again, as a file C as a, an in, as a, as an organization, I think that why one of the reasons this is really interesting as well is if you look at younger generations, people are living their lives in very different ways. So, for example, 
there is a very significant increase in number of 16 to 24 year olds who've never drunk alcohol, which is, and this has happened very, very recently. Um, similarly, sort of there, there is a growth in the number of people under 30 who, who aren't having any sort of physical relationships at all. So you're seeing some really interesting changes in the way younger people are living their lives, which is, um, and again, young, the portrayal of younger people is often very negative, but the reality is there, you know, I think particularly the alcohol and indeed smoking, the, you know, there is a, a generation who are growing up very, very different to, um, to, to what previous generations did and what this, how this will change things is, is in terms of what we do with our lives is, is really interesting. Um, one, of, one of the times I was lucky enough to go on um, to go on BBC Breakfast, I, I, I sort of, we did some work with a couple of other charities called the Ready for Aging Alliance. And, and the idea was I was starting to say, look, actually, and I think this is a bit about, you know, credit to, 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 to Janet and the team and the, and, and the, this, this, your, your committee, you know, actually what we were really saying is that there's so much out there that says you should do stop doing something when you get to a certain age. And I end up going on there saying, look, if you want to listen to One Direction or Metallica, you should do it. If you want to get on that scooter and ride around town, you should go and do it. If you want to go and be a VSO volunteer in, you know, Tanzania, you, you know, you should be thinking about doing it. It's actually about starting to, and, and ageism in some ways is one of those things that stops people from, from doing it. It's you know, it's not just the singers at Glastonbury who are now um, in their 80s and beyond. It's astonishing the average age of people who attend things like music festivals and concerts now. Oh, I think it's worth reflecting on actually. Sometimes we have sometimes a self-imposed ageism that means we think we're too old to do something. Sometimes it's that society sort of tells us we shouldn't be doing something because because of our age. And I think there's something about how how we and how you can sort of turn that around. But what's uh, the other side of that is this this idea sort of developing around this social recession and you know how we can make sure that people remain connected across their a across their lives and and, and post covid and of course covid was this you know a, you know has has changed things in all sorts of sorts of ways you know my um you know this is a, f a, f a few photos and you'll all be sort of you know aware of these sorts of stories the photo on the, the right was the the grandfather of one of the former uh, ILC members of staff who who died during COVID and she couldn't go to his funeral. There is a, a couple of my pre other colleagues down at the bottom who um, um, ended up having to basic get married without really any audience at uh, any audience at all because of because of COVID. And um, similarly, my grandmother's funeral was a very different affair than than it would have been. So, and I think the question is how do you how do we sort of come out sort of you know, it, and clearly COVID is still with us, but how do we come out and sort of address some of the changes in the way we, we're, we're living our lives? Um, um, so, so, so I think so there's a lot in how we spend our time that I think is worth us all all reflecting on. Um, clearly, one of the big barriers is 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 money. How can how can we afford to do it? So, just to sort of throw, I, I suppose, some thoughts around this. Clearly, one of the things that's changed is. Um, you know, pension credit has helped um, ensure that we didn't inevitably get poorer as we're older. We're getting more people saving. Um, debt, however, and low, um, relative low wages for younger people remain remains a challenge. And, and we are facing a future where with significant inequalities and where even in some of the richest places in the world, you see very significant differences in um, in income and wealth, and and some I'm sure some of you will have been to to Hong Kong. This um, the image on the right is Hong Kong. It's just outside the horse racing, the big Happy Valley horse racing stadium. So, and in Hong Kong, one of the richest places in the world, one of the healthiest places for many people, you have huge numbers of, you know, relatively small percentage, but huge numbers of people living in poverty. Um, so, so, so I think we, we do need to reflect on sort of those inequalities and what that means for, means for all of us. Um, 
Um, I'm going to jump out, jump over. Clearly, uh, it, the the world has got a bit more complex, and both younger and older people find it can find it hard. You know, the the changes in the way we have pensions, the changes where we draw down our pensions, the um, where, you know how complex it is to understand money, and and I think there's something about how how we can all think about um, you know what we know, what we don't know, and what we should know. So I won't say very much about that uh, and more about that. There's a slightly broader macro question or big picture question for uh, around sort of how our economy will change um, as a result of aging and what that means in terms of what what we should be doing and what what we could be doing. Um, clearly, Japan is a really interesting sort of precedent in this space where you've seen um, you know, it, it, really the first modern country to, to age and is still one of the oldest um, um, countries in the world. Hong Kong, I think, is actually a, a, um, slightly older. Um, but actually what you've seen in Japan is very significant economic and social challenges over the last sort of 20 or 30 years because of a failure to adapt society, a failure to adequately engage older people in, in society. Um, we're starting to see businesses recognise some of the changes. We're starting to see demographic changes. We're starting to in see insurers say, realise that we, we haven't got enough people of, of different generations in order to continue to support the economy. So there's some really big picture challenges there. And um, one of the things that's sort of worth us reflecting on, and some of you may have seen the story today, is that clearly at the moment, there's a lot in the news about how we support people beyond 50 to, to, to work. What we know is that meaningful activity and what i mean by that is frankly having something to do that means something to you and that could be work that could be volunteering it could be something else it could be caring um it is extraordinarily important for our health and uh, and well-being that actually if we you know and, and i think it, we for, for all of us there's a really really key lesson a key message that we need to we need to have purpose whether that's in our our you know our local our local u3a cycling group or or whether that's um, through through faith groups, or whether that's through work, or or, or other forms of volunteering, um, um, it could be anything. But what's really clear is that we are in a place from where where we do desperately need to support people to to, to work longer. Our economy absolutely needs it. Um, we just haven't got enough workers in the UK. We've got at the moment a 2.6 million shortage of uh, of of workers in the UK. Um, and, and that's likely to get worse because of ill health amongst um, people under under 65. So, so you know, everything from how we support social care to to health to how we run trains is being threatened by the fact we haven't got enough enough workers. Um, interestingly, I was talking to someone from a from a pensions company this morning who said that their their mother in law has has just gone back to work on work on a maternity ward at 76, I think which is sort of um she obviously decided she would she you know she was desperate to get back into the nhs but she was actually she wanted to do something that worked with children she wanted and there, there was a job there that she wanted to do so um it's not for everyone clearly but i think this question of of, of how we all have this meaningful activity how we all have purpose is extraordinarily really important not just for us but for our economy um and and clearly are you know there are fiscal challenges if we don't so just to this is a a graph that the office of budget responsibility produces but so does the institute for fiscal studies and what you'll see here to try and explain it very um it, and, and I'm not an economist. So basically, what you see is the the the, the lump between the age of 20 and 60 is the point 61 is the point at which we pay more in tax than we get it back. Um, so before we're 21, we get more in services, and the point at which we get to 66, we get um, we get more again from the state than we pay in tax. Um, now, clearly, for government, what they they need to do is just slightly push this curve a little bit at the, to the right, the curve in the middle. Um, it isn't about making people work forever, but actually, if you can if you can just encourage that curve to move a little bit further to the right, it helps reduce some of the the economic challenges that that government is facing. 
And it is worth saying, and I love these quotes, it's sort of, you know, I think the world is is changing quite a lot. Lord Fowler uh, last year said, I'm only 80, when he retired from Lords, I'm only 83, and unless I'm careful, I won't have time to start my new career, which I think is a lovely one. And then there was uh, a, a guy in the newspaper, you can sort of search it out, an 80-year-old guy who was a paper boy who, who, who had kept retiring, and then, um, and then basically he kept saying, oh, these young people, they're not reliable enough, and he kept coming back. But basically, he loved doing he loved chatting to people he loved that he loved the role um um so so there is you know there there is um um you know perhaps perhaps the world world world's changing a bit um and we know that the proportion of older workers is catching up with the the proportion of um uh, the the portion of people working in old age is, is is increasing and is is likely to continue to increase. Although COVID knocked this back by quite quite a lot because lots of people in their fifties and sixties decided that work wasn't worth the hassle, you know, or they lost their jobs and couldn't find couldn't find couldn't find new jobs. So um, so COVID has had a bit of a, a bit of an impact here. I think the other thing, yeah, you know, the other sort of thing is, is and it is worth recognising, you know, again around this positive, a third of all dollars across the G20, the richest countries in the world, are earned by people aged over 30. So there's a very significant economic um, cost um, contribution here and value of, of work. Um, and, and whilst, you know, there is all this sort of talk about all of these lots of, we have lots of older workers and it's increasing, the reality is actually we have a a, a similar proportion of men aged 65 working now as we had in the 1960s. So actually we have, uh, and that's partly because we found lots of reasons, ways to incentivize people out of work in the 80s and 90s, and then we realized it was a big mistake. So, so changed the, changed the you know, public policy and are now encouraging people back to work. Um, and it's still the case, again, despite COVID, the, the amount of time people can expect to live in retirement is increasing. Um, women slightly more than li living slightly more, uh, spending slightly more time than men in retirement, but it is still increasing, um, even with COVID. And we are adapting workplaces um, to, to, to adapt to sort of more of us working a little bit longer. Um, Clearly, one of the really interesting sort of challenges for it is how we continue to invest in education. I think people like you, Free A, have got an extraordinarily important role here. You know, the the formal and the informal learning has been squeezed. You know, there. Are, I remember when I started doing work on adult education and informal adult learning, and this was back in the um, early two thousands. And we were talking about how disastrous it was that that there wasn't the same informal learning as. Um, as there was sort of tw 10 years before and of course now the situation is much much worse um you know without you free a and others you would have nothing i remember when i was and this is when i was 18 or 19 i remember local authorities used to have you'd be able to sign up for a photography course or a cooking course and it was free and you just go in and it was amazing and and of course that's all gone now and if you live particularly if you live in places like london it's not just um it's not just not free it can be 300 pound a term 400 pound can be astonishingly expensive to access really basic, um, I say basic, really valuable learning opportunities. And I think there's something about how we uh, we can help. And I do think there is a role for, for you and for you free a in terms of actually how can we help fill the gap, particularly in the world where actually there is more information about that. There is more things on YouTube. There are, you know, how can we use what, if we haven't got the money, how do we use the tech to support learning more? Um, the other thing to, to to flag that I think we can all do as as we get older is frankly make sure we spend the money we've got. One of the things we know is that as we get older, um, and there's a whole series of reasons why this happens, but but we tend to there is this obsession with and and a slight worry in a government about people sort of overspending. But the reality is most people on average we underspend in old age. And of course, if 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 a very significant proportion of the wealth is being held by older people and it's not being either spent or invested in 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 the right sort of way, there's a very there is a risk that we're not then creating jobs. We need to create demand in the economy so so it's extraordinarily important that we do think about consumption 
um, as well uh, in terms of, uh, and I'm not saying you, by the way, you should go and fritter away all your money, by the way, um, you do what you want, but, but actually there is, but, but I think there's a broader message around just making sure that as we get older, we don't, we don't save, for, we just don't all save for that rainy day and then find ourselves that where we haven't made the most of the, the wealth we built up during our lives. Um, maybe we we'll want to talk about that. Um, clearly, um, you know, and, and, and our evidence is that spending by older people could drive co costs and actually help meet some of the age related costs governments are really worried about. Um, we're expecting, and again, this is a really interesting opportunity. Our modeling suggests that we will see a growth in spending by older people around on in relation to recreational culture, 63 billion transport, housing and services. So, so you are seeing sectors where older people are going to and will spend more money. So how can we adapt to those products and services so that they meet, meet our needs as we get older? Um, uh, clearly though, you know, there is more and more of us are living with, with dementia, more and more of us, are, we have more diverse experiences as we age. And it's important that we, that we do recognize, you know, in a, in a world where we have millions and millions of people over 65, that we are, we're all a bit different. Um, we have a thing, one thing sort of worth, worth reflecting on is that, you know, I do think we've seen change in terms of the, you know, the market. I think, you know, uh, and I can see the number of you on um, iPads, you know, you imagine how complex it was would have been 15 20 years ago to do this and you know we we had computers that were so hard to use and tvs that were so hard to use and telephones that were so hard to use and even tin openers that were so hard to use and and actually to be fair to the designers out there we have slowly started to change these things we have a world that's a little bit easier for all of us and this is because they've realized this isn't frankly about older people or age is actually having a something like an iPad that's really easy to use is good for a 20 year old or a six year old as it is for a 70 year old or a 90 year old. So, so I think things have changed. Um, you're seeing companies like Lego um, actually apparently having more, um, making more sales. They're very guarded about this, but they have more members of their club who are adults than our children. So Lego are making huge amounts of money from adults as opposed to from children. You know, these sets that they have are two, three hundred pounds a, a, a time. So, so you are starting to see very significant changes in in the way in the sort of products and services. Um, I, I think there's something sort of worth reflecting and this is you know quite an old sort of thing, but you know, is that, um, you know, this this story, and I think it's relevant to sort of how we all spend our lives that, you know, you you see this quite a lot, you know, where you get a marketing person talks about people having fewer ties to family, they paid for their homes, they're free from obligation, they can do what they want, they're, they're free, they're more free than ever before. Um, and then and then you look at this and realize this was written in 1962. So, so we've been saying that you know the world is changing for sort of 50 60 years and 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 has it changed very much and and clearly the the ad in industry uh, and i think there's a role for all of us to call this out you know the portrayal of all of us we get older is mad sometimes you know the, these two photos i leave in because because they're they're interesting because you know, the one on the top left, um, I don't know a single person who would go running in their jeans. Um, and yet, for some reason, the insurance industry has decided that's how they want to sell us things. Um, and, and similarly, the one on the bottom, I don't know a single woman who would put her wicker basket on wet sand. Um, and, and yet, for some reason, we've decided this is how we sell. We sell aging and we sell stories to people. It's just nonsense. Um, so I'm going to be very quickly go, go through go through health and care. Clearly, keeping our there is greater awareness around around health and care. Without a doubt, keeping ourselves healthy. Um, um, whatever age that is in our lives is an extraordinarily important part of uh, of keeping ourselves active. We know that the the healthier we are, the more we spend, the more we work, the more we volunteer, um, and 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 the more we care. So so it's really important that we that we do you know think about think about how we can keep ourselves keep ourselves healthy. And and without a doubt, there is 
a role for some innovation in in this space we're not very good at it and i you know again i love this that you know the british british adults spend on average three hours on the toilet compared to one and a half hours being physical active physically active you know the reality is we say we all want to be active but it, we become less and less active not just in our 70s but from our 20s you know we start getting less active you know how can we turn that around how can we get and i think that the bottom right i'm sure some of you some of you on there will be will be uh, involved in local park runs and things these 5k walks and runs on a saturday you know that it opens up things like physical activity to to people who are not running running around in five kilometers in 16 minutes but actually just getting people out there and walking and it's really really important um um, so I won't say very much else except except health is that clearly, you know, keeping ourselves healthy is, is an extraordinarily important part of of what we're what we need to do in this space. And I think the final area is sort of this question of, you know, how, how do we adapt our our homes and our housing and our communities as we get older? And I've got this one theory we might come to in questions around places like Benidorm and Las Vegas are really interesting age friendly cities, but maybe we'll leave that for leave that for the discussion they're, they're actually places that recognize older consumers and have adapted their services in order to to do that um we're um you know we're seeing i think um it's really important that we think about um, where we want to live. My my boss who who died died last year was was very passionate about us all making the right choices about our housing and what we want to do. And she she I remember her saying to me, well, because she moved from a, a a big townhouse to a flat, and she said, you know, I spent forty years telling people that they needed to think about their housing, and I can't not do it myself. So I think there is something, but equally making sure that you know that we're adapting our homes. One of the things we all do of all age is too late is we wait until after we've fallen over to fit the grab rail the grab rail absolutely works it's really important we do it but but that we wait until afterwards is really really it's bad and this should not just be for older people you know it's very easy for someone in their 20s and 30s to slip over in their home as well it's really important and yet because these products are not easy to access and they're they're sold as disability aids they're not attractive enough to be worked they're sensible products in the same way glasses are um um so uh, final thing just sort of to flag actually is around tech and clearly huge opportunities around around technology for to, to make life easier for us um government's a bit obsessed with technology they think technology will save us from aging and they every white paper says oh technology will make it much better um but actually the reality is that we're not gonna um, make the most of technology unless we properly fund care, unless we design things better, unless um, we think about regulation and data sharing. Um, and uh, and I suppose one of the things that's worth worth you know for me the future is almost certainly not these big robots on the right hand side. It's probably more the 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 vacuum cleaners, the sort of self you know cleaning va the vacuum cleaners that go around your floor when you're in bed and things like that it's potentially you know driverless cars it's potentially using some of these platforms like ebay and airbnb and task rabbit to sort of keep a, keep us having purpose a tax i'll just finish with task rabbit's a really interesting one where you say well actually this this you know is a platform some of you will know where you can go on and say look i i'm a real expert in fixing tennis rackets i'll do it for you know, 14 pound an hour or whatever they whatever they're going in. And, and it just gives people a platform to sell services, sell themselves. And I think there's a really interesting question about, you know, how people of all ages can start selling the skills that they have. Etsy is extraordinarily popular as um, a, a service where people sell crafts. You know, actually, is there some opportunities there? Airbnb in London, one of the things that was happening was there, there were Is everything all right, David? Yeah, can Seems you hear me? Have, yeah, we've got you back. Oh, Great. Yeah, sorry about sorry about that. My my microphone messed up. Um, so yeah, the last thing.
sorry, sorry. Um, so, so, so the final thing, yeah, all the people in London using Etsy, but also renting my room, renting rooms out on Airbnb. To, uh, and of course, it allowed people to bring some income in, but actually also gave people some company for a couple of nights a week. Some really interesting things with some of this tech we can think about. So at that point, as I had 40 minutes and I've done 43, so sorry, Jenna, I'm going to stop now and um, sort of open to sort of any, you know, pass back to, to colleagues in, and you yourself in terms of any questions or thoughts or observations. And you can tell me I'm wrong or whatever. I don't really mind. But thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much indeed, David. That, that's been that's been really great. Obviously, you've you've galloped through a huge amount of information there. Um, we've had quite a few questions, and there's time for others of you to put your questions in the chat room. But I'll just start with um, with some of the ones we've had. The, Sheila says, "Why is it anticipated that aging in France is going to be significantly less in 2026?" Please, I think she meant 20. Yeah. 60. Yeah, so so um, I think what essentially, of course, because um, places like France and the UK have, have have and certainly had, and those figures were pre-Brexit, had seen um, migration from younger places. So you'd seen migration in of younger people. So what what's happened in Western Europe, of course, in UK, France, and uh, Germany, is we've seen migration of younger people into um, in for into those into those countries, and that's one of the drivers. Now, clearly, post-COVID, things might change. And one of the other things that might change is, of course, the economies in places like Poland and Romania um, are doing actually very well. So you might start start to see, you know, you might see a, a turnaround, and people might might go go back home. So huge amounts of uncertainty but but actually um you know the the big picture you know certainly pre-brexit was the anticipation that you know 2060 sort of the uh and i say it's fundamentally because people from younger people from central and eastern europe going to um going into western europe which has meant that in eastern europe they end up with mainly older people staying mm -hmm. yeah. thanks and the and then um, we had a question from Liz. She wondered. She said she wasn't sure that your U.S. time use data is very accurate. And if it is, there are wide interpretations, location, occupation, etc. Any comment? Yeah. So I I think it's pretty solid. And the stuff we've seen from the U.K. is very very is very similar. Of course, that is an average across the whole population. So if you went to rural areas, it would be very different from urban. If you went to poorer communities, it would be different from richer communities. So so it is an average. So so you know I think more than anything else, else it is useful as a a tool to have conversations as opposed to suggest that everyone lives their life life like that. Because without a doubt, lots of people, you know. Do all sorts of different things as they as they as they age. So 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 I think the the um, we had a UK survey in 2014 that did a very similar thing, and the English Longitudinal Study of Aging has has some time use data as well. But but you know I think for me it's more it's an interesting platform thing to allow us to talk about. You know, and actually even if, even if it's for you to say well I disagree with it, actually that's quite useful. You can say well actually me and all my friends do this. Uh, it, it's an opportunity. It's a I I think the data is interesting. Thank you, thanks. And um, we've had and then and live white. Lie Waters said, I disagree with your statement about poverty in Hong Kong. Richness of the country doesn't imply universal wealth in the country. Hong Kong's a very good example of a rich capitalist culture, i.e. the rich get richer, etc. What you need is a caring society. Uh, an example is Singapore. You don't see any slum dwellers because of welfare provided by the government and the people there. I think I think Singapore and Hong Kong are both really interesting for exactly those re those reasons. And and I think you know I, I, it is you know as you say you know the you know it it is I think the core point I was trying to make is it's really striking that in places like Hong Kong, which are absolutely uh, at a population level, and you know they are the richest place in the world, and you still see this huge poverty. <laughs> Singapore is 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 absolutely is, is very different. Now the question for Singapore is as Singapore. Singapore doesn't really have a, a 
very much of a safety net if so if things go wrong um uh, in singapore you it's not easy and what happens in singapore when the the malaysian care workers because there's a huge amount of reliance on malaysian um workers who come and um work in people's homes what happens when they get old and go back to malaysia there's a really it, you know there is you know the next 20 or 30 years big challenges i think for singapore which is why they're interesting countries to look at as well because they will absolutely invest in this space and singapore has not had a good couple of years, like Hong Kong, but, but post COVID, have not have a, had a good couple of years from an economic point of view. Thanks. And then the next question is um, in terms of skill spread, what's the profile of the 2.6 million shortfall in employment in the UK? So it's basically everything. And it's not just unskilled, it's skilled, it's unskilled. Clearly, the health service, we we don't have enough occupational therapists, we don't have enough surgeons. Well, one of the greatest ones is actually, I saw one stat which says we haven't got enough celebrities. So we haven't even got enough um, chief execs. So apparently, you know, so if you do Google, a Google search for, you know, skills shortage x you know you will find almost every industry says they haven't got en enough skilled skills you know we haven't got enough indian chefs we haven't got enough chinese chefs we haven't got enough farmers the out farmers tend to be relatively old now the average age of a farmer is very very high relatively um and both in terms of indian chefs chinese chefs um farmers one of the issues is the children don't want to do it so the children want to go to agricultural college and be a consultant or want to they or, and they don't, certainly don't want to manage the the chinese or indian restaurant they want to go and do something else and and so there are some really significant challenges but almost every sector of the economy um ha, has huge skill shortages you know the the nighttime economy bars and clubs you know bars and restaurants you know what you're seeing is companies like Tesco, Aldi, Lidl pushing up the wages of um, of staff which uh, which is competing with NHS staff and social care staff which is making it harder for health and social care to recruit staff because basically Tesco's and Sainsbury's are taking all of the uh, the, the staff who were just above minimum wage. I, I certainly endorse that I'm on the on the board of an association where care workers are the, you know, we've got 30% vacancies. It's uh, yeah. can't compete. The um, we've had two questions about the French Macron's trying to yeah. raise the retirement age. One is, do you endorse his policy on yeah. old age pensions? And the second one is, what's your view on the French French pension protests? One point is that life expectancy varies depending on occupation. Yeah. So so I think there's a few things here. I I absolutely think we have to increase state pension in the UK and we're going to have to say edge age in the UK and we're absolutely going to have to if we don't. And it's simply because and despite the front page story on the Financial Times this way, life expectancy is still growing in the UK. Life expectancy is still growing. You know, the front page of the, the, the Financial Times this week said life expectancy is falling. It's not. It's still growing. Um, we have more of us living longer. Um, it, if we don't increase state pension age um, in the UK, and you know it's a political choice, government could choose not to. It means you're going to have to cut services for younger people or increase taxes. So, so there are your choices. You know, where and 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 France is in a, a, a in some ways a harder position that, position than the UK now. Um, now, in the inequalities point is 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 absolutely the the important point for me. The it is not for the state pension to tackle um, to ha tackle health inequalities, and actually we should be using other benefits to 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 do that. But um, but, but but without a doubt, you know the the risk is that um we, we're just going to find it harder and harder to pay for anything that isn't the state you know the, the state pension is going to take more and more of our our funding now again yeah it's political if government decides to to tax more or to um uh, or we have growth then that's an, that's an alternative way way forward um we've actually one thing that's worth saying is we you know in the uk and and of course the uk is is different to france in that we have a stronger second and third pension so a lot more people have occupational pensions in the uk more people have housing well but particularly you have more people with um employer pensions um and of course you know for lots of people in the uk the state pension is just one part of retirement income so as much as i would really like to get a, a pension as early as i possibly can I, I i i'm not sure 
I, I think if government chooses not to, which in the UK, which it looks like they're they're saying they aren't going to, um, I think what will happen is they say they're not going to do, it and it will come to the next government, and the government the next government will find that they they have to. I think there's an element of inevitability unless people decide they want to fairly significant increases in tax. That's been really interesting, David. Thank you very much indeed. And I hope that people have enjoyed it.